In a world of constant change, where do we find the strength to hold on to our faith, our family, and our community? Seek answers to the questions that shape our lives and our faith with Bishop Daniel E. Flores. A man of compassion, of wisdom, of deep faith and steadfast love, a humble leader and powerful teacher. Bishop Flores leads us on a journey of discovery and renewal through Quest, a series that explores the essence of living a life of faith and purpose. Come, explore questions of faith and witness how he illuminates Christ's enduring love in our world today. Welcome to Quest with Bishop Daniel E. Flores. Welcome to Quest on Shalom World. I'm your host, Oscar Adhami, here with Bishop Daniel E. Flores. Bishop, good to see you again. Oscar, it's good to be with you. And so today the topic is the Synod on Synodality. And the theme is communion, participation, and mission. So, Bishop, before we get started uh, with the discussion, explain to us what exactly is synodality. Synodality is a is a is a way of expressing sort of the way ch the church moves through time and history in the sense that as a communion, that's why the word communion is so important. You know, the Catholic Church is a hierarchical church. You know, there are bishops, successors to the apostles, and the priesthood has is, is been instituted by Christ. But, it's, but it includes also the whole communion of the faithful, the baptized, who each have a, a special role uh, in, in fulfilling the mission, part of the body of Christ, as St. Paul speaks about. So synodality is really, is really how the body of the church sort of communicates with, each, with how we communicate with each other, how we pray together, and how, as the Holy Father says, we discern the way forward, uh, being how to be faithful to Christ in a world that uh, often is, you know, changes very quickly, and, and to kind of give, give and to fulfill the mission, which is why mission is one of the other big important words, uh, fulfill the mission of announcing Christ in the new way that the gospel offers to us. So it's a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way the church expresses its communion as a body, um, and that the synod, specific, specifically the way the Holy Father is talking about it, invites the participation of everyone, which is everyone has a, has a, a part to play in, in living out the gospel and giving witness to the world. Over the centuries, the church has convened many gatherings of its leaders, some of which are known as synods and councils. These meetings have served as a space for discussion in deciding on significant matters of faith, doctrine, and Christian life. Under the guidance of Pope Francis, the Synod on Synodality takes as its theme communion, participation, and mission. The aim is to build a long-term vision of a synodal church, one that encourages the people of God to discern together how to advance in unity, not merely through meetings and administration, but by embodying the church's communal nature as a people. Led by the Holy Spirit, journeying together to proclaim the gospel. This upcoming synod would also attempt to address some sensitive topics. But at its core, synodality represents the church's way of life and mission. It emphasizes unity and active participation, reflecting the church's true nature as a communion of believers journeying together to share the gospel. So there have been synods uh, in the history of the church, uh, numerous synods. Yes, in fact, you know, synod, in as much as it expresses sort of an assembly uh, in the early church, uh, we probably find the first sort of expression of that uh, in the Acts of the Apostles, when the apostles had to meet with the believers uh, to discern sort of certain decisions about what parts of the Mosaic law the new Christian community was obligated to follow and which parts not. There was discussion there, you see it in the Acts of the Apostles, and then ultimately a decision was made. Uh, and that was the way the church, very in her infancy, was deciding to move forward. Uh, so uh, sometimes people think, well, synodality means we're all going to vote on what the decisions are. And it doesn't really mean that. It means that there's, a, as the Holy Father says, a discerning hearing of the, of the wisdom of the faithful because the Holy Spirit inhabits the whole of the church and not just the clergy, um, hearing that so that those who are entrusted, for example, the bishops, with making decisions uh, uh, that affect the current 
sort of way we live our lives as Catholics um, can can have been can be made in in sort of the with the benefit of the participation of the voice as, of as many as possible, and so and because the decisions have to be made, uh, you know how to face the challenges that you know today that weren't even dreamed of twenty years ago. Sure, and so uh, so it, it is it does have that sense of the of participation as you mentioned in the Holy Fathers talks about it a lot and as as a way that we have listening and praying and thinking and and how to move forward but it's an expression of the, of the of the hierarchical communion of the church and then and it puts off for the sake of the mission so so it's nothing really new but I think what the Holy Father is looking for is for the church to kind of really kind of come to grips with with how do we encourage as much participation as possible in the mission of the church. You mentioned the hierarchy of the church and in and, and reading about this latest synod on, on synodality, uh, the, the laity is also represented there. Is this the first time that's happened or has it happened in the past? Well, I think it's probably happened more informally in the ancient world. It, 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 that is in the first, we call the patristic era, the first five centuries of the church's life. Um, but we don't have a lot of documents about that. We know that the bishops were present, like, in, you know, at synodal meetings. Often the synod in the ancient church meant a gathering of the local church, you know, like a province or like, like North Africa would meet or, or Asia Minor would meet instead of the whole church. Um, and so synod is, is anytime an assembly of the church took place, and the bishops would be the ones to deliberate and ultimately make a decision with regard to kind of what needed to be addressed, like what was f facing us right now that we needed. For example, in times of persecution, the bishops had to give guidance to the people as to how they were to respond to the challenge of, of, of being asked to deny their faith uh, in the face of a, of, 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 a, of a very hostile world back then. So, so in more modern times, the Second Vatican Council uh, which was celebrated uh, 1961 to 1965, uh, you know, opened up the possibility of regular meetings in, 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 of bishops uh, and synod to give advice to the Pope. It's a consultative body. Pope Paul VI sort of established it uh, as a regular intervals. The bishops would have a topic to discuss. And, and the presumption was that the bishops were listening to their people. And I think for the most part, bishops do. I mean, I think, I think you, 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 we're out amongst the people and we kind of know what people are concerned about, what their fears are, what their hopes are. But, but, but that the bishops would meet and, and discuss things. We've had synods on things like catechesis. We've had synods on, on, uh, on scripture, just to discuss how can we, how can we highlight this. What is uh, fairly new in the is that explicitly it's kind of uh, a, a specific decision of the Holy Father that when the bishops meet in synod in Rome, which which happens as part of the post Vatican II um, sort of uh, things that were asked for by Pope Paul VI, that this is the first time that the that the that laity and religious brothers and sisters and priests. Uh, were invited to participate as voting members. There have always been experts and theologians and lay people sort of assisting the bishops, um, but this is the first time that, that, the, that, the, that the Pope has, has specifically asked for and, and granted that. I want to continue our discussion, but right now let's hear from more of the faithful and some questions that they have. If this synod is going to listen to ordinary people, then how do I know that public opinions don't form the decisions of the synod? How can you say that God is guiding the synod? Well, I think one of the one of the uh, um, major sort of emphasis that the Holy Father makes with regard to the synod this time, which is a synod on synodality, uh, is to encourage at the local level ordinary people expressing what their hopes and fears of the church in you know for the future of the church so ordinary people in the parishes expressing what their deepest hopes are what their what their concerns are um, and so so there is an aim there to hear from people in the pews people who maybe aren't as active in the church as maybe they used to be or even but to hear the voices of these and and i think i think that element is always going to be present in synodality and that has a kind of a perennial value to it because it's not like like we're all we have these meetings in our parishes which many places did to hear have listening sessions from basically parishioners um, and and we took notes and we prepared a little report and it went on up the line to the arch you know to the metropolitan or and then to the region and then to the united states conference of bishops and then it went to rome in a, in a sort of a summary of what it all was uh, the the idea is that 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 there's a, a a value to the local voice that is not lost and so like for example in my own diocese 
we have people who have expressed sort of what their concerns are, what their hopes are, what they would, what we think we need to be able to fulfill our mission better. And we always have that. And we want to be able to kind of use that as a basis for kind of charting our course forward. The question is, do people, you know, how can we be sure that God, you know, that public opinion isn't, well, you know, in the end, I, I must, you know, I believe that when something is, is, is when the church is, is, is following the lead of the successor of Peter, that when we pray not to be influenced by the, by the spirit of the world in making our decisions, uh, and, and especially with the, with, the, with, the, with the role of the bishops in communion with, with, with the Pope in terms of kind of discerning that, uh, I, I have no fear that that that's sort of how it's going to be hijacked in some way. Um, it may get sort of bumpy. People may say things we don't. But in the end, I think that the spirit has a way of overcoming human limitations because I think sometimes we're we're influenced by public opinion even when we don't think we are. We just need to kind of pray for purification, continue to listen to the local voices, do the best we can in our local churches to make the mission more effective, faithful to Christ, listening to each other, faithful to the hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit, speaking in Scripture, and just move forward and don't be afraid. This is one of the things. Um, a faithful people who try their best by the grace of the Holy Spirit, we need not be afraid that somehow uh, the evil one will hijack it because God is more powerful than that. Is the Synod worth the time and expenses being spent in gathering so many clergy and laymen from various parts of the world? Why is the Synod significant? Well, I, I mean, obviously, it's a great investment going on, you know, because we, even in our local churches, we had we had meetings and we had sessions, we had moments of prayer, we had we had um, it was just kind of like in the United States, parallel to the to the Eucharistic uh, rene renewal because there was an attempt to gather people locally. And so, so there's a certain investment of time because money is not the only thing that's valuable, uh, the investment of time and the investment of resources and priorities. I think when you talk about, you know, the, the gathering in, Rome's, in Rome when you have representatives from around the world, I think it's very much uh, uh, very valuable. And, and certainly uh, it, because where else are you going to have a chance to hear from the poorest parts of the world about what it's like to be Catholic in a persecuted place or in a place where, where, where you risk your life by accepting baptism. I heard from bishops who know that this is happening, that I have people who, who risk their life by coming and asking our little church for baptism because that is a gift to the whole church that we don't get so closed into our own little world and everything has to be the way it is here and, and, and it's eye-opening. And so where else and how, you know, in the life of the church, how else are we going to be able to hear living voices of people who are living an experience of the church, which is, which is, which is a challenge to us all with regard to fidelity? I must say that, and the fruit of that when it comes to the document, and, but also in the way the Holy Father takes it to heart and the bishops, I come home affected by that. And there's, a, there's sort of a ripple effect around the church. You, you can't come out of hearing those sorts of stories uh, of, of real witness and real faithfulness without being changed. And that's that's part of the the one-on-one -on -one witness of the church. And so I, I think it's well worth the expense. And and you know, and money is not the most important thing. Um, people getting together and sort of being fortified in their faith this way, because what I saw was exactly that. And so and so I, I think, you know, this 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 wisdom that comes from the church sort of gathering and and and, and talking about that because uh, especially the witness, because uh, the tendency, I must say, in my view, the tendency of the Western industrialized world, where the Catholic Church is a presence, it has been a presence for a long time, is, is not to have opportunities to hear from what the Pope would call the periphery, and I, I, which is the edges, the, the, the little countries where, where the Church is living a new life that's kind of blossoming in certain in Africa and Asia and and to hear from that and to kind of and to kind of nurture it. So I just think that that that, that it's a tremendous gift uh, for the life of the church and 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 that it it bears fruit in ways that only God can foresee. Is this synod going to lead to any controversial decisions and radical changes in the church? I've come across some news in the media regarding these developments. For example, 
Is the church going to allow female ordinations? Right. I think it's. I think it's a very important question about about the synod and what what's kind of what the end result. I uh, I think I think it's realistic to expect that the synod on synodality at the end of the October session twenty four will make some pretty concrete recommendations to the to the Holy Father about about how to open up certain structures that make it possible to encourage the participation of the laity. Um, with regard to kind of formulating decisions, um, because the, dis the synod makes a distinction between between making a decision and taking a decision. It's not a. Uh, it, it works better in English, in Spanish, and in, in a certain other languages. Uh, hacer la decisión y tomarla. It's one thing to make that is who do you talk to? How do you get the information? How does a, who who's who does the bishop consult with to kind of say who can help me make? And then in the end, after prayer, to make a decision. I, I think. The synod itself will talk about how we can do that better, which is not completely, but largely a structural question. Um, like, for example, parish councils or diocesan councils uh, that advise the bishop. Or I have a, you know, and most every bishop in the United States has a has a finance council. I I have to talk to them about, and I have to show them the audit, and I because there's a consultation. It's it's transparency. The finance council, they're committed lay people. They know their business, and and they see kind of what the budget of the diocese looks like and what the audit came out. So it's all clear. I think one of the things the synod is asking for is transparency with regard to those sorts of things. In that sense, it's a synod about how you how are you more consultative? How can we be more participatory for the sake of the mission? So I don't expect any 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 radical you know doctrinal decisions because the synod is not designed as a decision making body. Uh, what it can do is ask the Holy Father to consider something, um, but then the Holy Father is considering things all the time, and so and and then he would take whatever counsel he wants to take. So I, I think fear that you know the synod's going to vote at the end and it's going to bind everybody to a thing that we never saw before, like we're going to reinvent the church. The, the church is not being reinvented. She's simply stretching her wings, so to speak, to kind of be more true to who she is from the very beginning, which is a hierarchical church in the communion of the baptized, walking together through history for the sake of announcing the kingdom. Some of the controversial sort of issues that have been around for, for a while, like, for example, the, the ordination of women to the, to the priesthood in the Catholic Church, um, uh, or to the diaconate, which is another aspect of that question. Uh, they're distinct questions, and I think the, the issue has come up um, uh, as something that, in some, you know, in some parts of the church, there's a there's a desire to reopen some of those questions. Um, the, I think the Holy Father knows that, and and he has specifically said that he has established a theological commission to look at the question of the diaconate, not the priesthood, because. My sense of the of the magisterium of the church is that that's that's fairly in the Catholic Church a closed question since John Paul II. Um, the Holy Father can look at that, but I think the issue of the diaconate will have to see what the what the uh, what the uh, what the what that commission. But again, even the commission will make a recommendation to the Holy Father as to whether it's possible, uh, you know, to ordain to the diaconate to ordain women to the diaconate. I think that's one. But the Synod will not vote on that issue. It's not, it's like the, the, what the Synod could say is Holy Father, and he's already said, I, we, will, we, are, we are looking at this. But you know, when we look at things in the church, we took it in dialogue with also, you know, our, you know, the Orthodox Church has a long tradition also. So do the other, other apostolic churches. Um, you know, the Catholic Church is not the only apostolic church. Um, uh, not all of those churches are in communion with Rome, but we talk a lot. And so I think those are some of the things, because you can't make a, a discernment about that without looking at the whole history of the church. On the issue of like marriage, I think, you know, even during the Synod, uh, you know, the Holy Father was very clear. The teaching of the church on marriage is a given of the gospel. Marriage is between, you know, a man and a woman. It's for life and it's open to life. And it was even reiterated most recently by the by the dicastery for the for the doctrine of the faith. Now, what do you do pastorally with persons who are in irregular situations, for example, divorced and remarried? Uh, that's a pastoral question. What is the best way? You don't abandon people in the church. You announce the teaching, but how do you help them um, to draw as close to God as possible? Because, you know, 
all of the church is about is drawing people as close to God as possible. Given the fact that this is what marriage is, this is given the fact that this is what the church teaches, what Jesus himself, you know, was not afraid to talk about. How can we, you know, be witnesses to that in a world that, that is maybe not very receptive? Um, the church can remain true to who she is, especially in her teaching, but uh, cannot be deaf to the fact that, that, that there are people outside the church who, who, who see it differently. Uh, we can do that. I mean, we can be true to ourselves and still, and still open ourselves to hearing what the world is thinking, but we don't necessarily conform ourselves to what the world is thinking. Throughout history, the church has played a pivotal role in shaping both society and humanity. The Holy Spirit has continually guided the church, showing His wisdom through members of the church, even during the darkest times. The Synod on Synodality marks a significant milestone for the church as it seeks to unite the members of the church and highlight the church's attentiveness to the voices within. The church has faced many challenges over the years and has responded to societal shifts. For instance, the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s brought significant reform that reshaped church practices to better engage with the modern world. Even while so, the church has always upheld the deposit of faith and moral teachings, despite changing societal norms. So even while new problems may emerge with the evolving world, with the Synod on Synodality, the Catholic Church reaffirms her commitment to listen to and respond to the needs of her people, trusting in the guidance of the Holy Spirit. You know, Bishop, it's always great to hear from the faithful in, in our community and, and, and especially the youth to, to find out, as you mentioned, you know, we need to listen to the, the young people and, and find out what they're thinking because they might end up knowing more than we do. Mm. Uh, let me ask you, did inclusivity ever come up? The practice of the church in terms of, of, of how the church preaches the gospel and, and how the church receives people is not sort of like going to be radically changed. Because inclusivity, you know, I think there is a Catholic way to understand it. Um, that, that's, that, you know, that's not necessarily the way the world would understand it. Um, part of the word Catholic means announced to the whole world. It doesn't matter what race, what language, what tongue, what part of the world. What The gospel is for all. It is announced to all. And whenever, you know, an adult, for example, comes for baptism, you know, say there's, a, there's an opening question, you know, the person presents themselves, what do you ask of God's church? And the, 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 the option for answers are, you could say, I, baptism, uh, eternal life, um, the way of Christ. They all are basically the same thing. Everyone is invited, but we all have to make a conscientious decision as to whether I can follow the way of Christ. But the way of Christ is the way of Christ. And, and that's not going to change. He calls us all to radical conversion. And, and, and conversion hurts sometimes. You know, in just in one of the recent Gospels of the Daily Mass, you know, the rich young man, what must I do to inter inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, sell what you have and give to the poor. And he went away sad. Uh, I think inclusion is, we, we, the way of Christ is open to all, but the way of Christ is the way of Christ. And the church is not going to change, because we can't, what the basic fundamental requirements of the gospel, which is conversion. So in that sense, uh, you know, the right of Christian initiation of adults is a good sort of, sort of pattern for how we understand inclusion. Everyone is welcome. And if you need help following the way of Christ, if you're open to following the way of Christ, we, we will welcome you, we will work with you, um, but, but you have to make a decision because Christ is not just what we make him to be, he, he's the living Lord of the church and the gospel is a living announcement and the teaching of the church is, I, the church believes, is an, adequate, is, is, is an expression of, of the teaching of Christ. And so conversion is always the element. And I think this, is, this has been discussed in the Synod and will continue to be discussed. You know, to be an inclusive church, to be a church is welcoming and is patient and is kind, but also calls to conversion. And you can't not call to conversion and be faithful to Christ. So, yes, the church has to embrace the imperfect, because we all are, because Christ came for sinners. But the church needs to call to holiness. 
uh, not because we're all holy and self-righteous, but because he calls us to that. And we're not being faithful to each other if we're not calling each other to deep radical conversion. And Christ is the model. For anyone who might be interested in following the Synod and, and everything that comes uh, le leading up to October and, and after, wh where do you think someone might be able to, uh, a solid resource that they can count on? Well, um, for example, the, uh, in their local diocese, they may find, find certain uh, documents that, that are available from the local consultations that happen in the city, because it's always interesting and good and to find out what's going on in your local church in terms of trying to open up some of these avenues of, of conversation in the Holy Spirit. You know, I, I think the USCCB, the Bishop's Conference of the United States, but I mean, Bishop's Conference around the world would have resources. You know, one of the things that's interesting, one of the things the Holy Father, which was also an innovation uh, at the last synod, is he asked the, the synod participants not to speak to the media about what we discussed and who said what. He said, you could talk, of course, to reporters and things about, you know, but he wanted that to remain a prayerful atmosphere so that it would not sort of get, you know, pulled into this, you know, who's winning, who's losing sort of thing, which really shocked a lot of people because no one had ever, no Pope had ever asked that before. And, you know, when the Pope asks, he's really telling you, I do not wish you to speak. Because then it becomes, well, which faction is winning? And it's, and synodality is really against the idea of factions. Um, so was St. Paul in his letters, by the way. That was kind of a big issue for him. You know, I think it's hard, but I think, I think you know, there, there's some beautiful things that the Holy Father has written on synodality. And, and, and the documents that have come out, they're kind of lengthy, but they're worth meditating on. And 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 just thinking about as kind of what the issues are and how we and how how maybe we're kind of coming to a new moment of consensus with regard to moving forward on how best to be you know a church in mission bishop it's always a pleasure oscar thank it's always so much with you thank you bishop can you lead us in in a final prayer i'd be happy to thank you let us pray the father and of the son and of the holy spirit almighty god heavenly father by the death and resurrection of your son you poured out the holy spirit in the hearts of the faithful we ask that our hearts might even be enkindled by the love of the Spirit and by the light of the Spirit to make us wise in choosing how to build up the kingdom which, which, uh, which you, Heavenly Father, your Son, uh, offered his life to water and to build. And make us agents of the announcement of the gospel. Help us to be kind. Help us to live charity before all things else. And help us in, 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 to be mindful of the needs of our brothers and sisters, especially of the poor so that whatever we say and do might be a reflection of the goodness of the Lord Jesus, risen from the dead, and might in all things give glory to your name. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Son of the Holy Spirit, amen. And we thank you for joining us today on Quest. Until next time, let us continue our walk with Christ, and may your blessings be abundant. Ten years of sharing the peace of Christ. Shalom World, God's own channel.